Okay, we'll be using the Etherpad for collaborative note taking. Everyone is welcome to take notes during today's session. Um, do we have a designated note taker for today's session? Okay, we can all. Oh, go ahead. No, I didn't. Uh, I, I didn't arrange for anyone. I didn't know if I was supposed to. Okay, no problem. Hold on. Let me make sure we get the. Um, let me get the. Uh, Toby, can you repost the Etherpad just in case someone joined us? Thank you. Toby is my impromptu helper, and he didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and so um, if you have a question, you can use the raise hand feature um, in Zoom and I will call on you. If you recently attended instructor training and are going through the checkout process, um, this session, um, if you're going through the checkout process, attending this session can count as your community discussion. If you would like to use this session for checkout, please send an email to instructor instructor.carpentries at carpentries.org with the word checkout in the subject line. Make sure to include your name and the name and date of the session. Finally, as this is a Carpentries event, we must abide by our organization's code of conduct. I am adding a link in the Zoom chat um, for our code of conduct. And if you can also find a link at the top of the etherpad, um, any form of behavior to exclude, intimidate, or cause discomfort is a violation of the code of conduct to foster a positive and professional learning environment. We ask you to use welcoming and inclusive language, be respectful of different viewpoints and experiences, gracefully accept constructive criticism, focus on what is best for the community and show courtesy and respect towards other community members. If you believe someone has violated the code of conduct, you can report the violation to the Carpentries Code of Conduct Committee by completing the following form. And I don't have my chat up, but here we go. Here is our code of conduct. And if you would like to um, fill out a code of conduct, you can complete this form. Or you can send a direct message to myself in the Zoom chat. Um, does anyone have any questions before we get started? Okay, I am handing it over to our session leads. And that would be me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and um, good day, everyone. I need to get into the habit of saying good day and not good morning. Um, Uh, I can just, uh, yeah, so um, welcome, and I'm glad to see you all here. Um, so my name, as she said, is Janetta Stein, and I am a senior research software engineer at Newcastle University here in the UK. So today with my colleagues, Colin Sozi and Abhishek Dasgupta, you might notice them here on, on, in the gallery of photos. <laughs> Um, we want to firstly tell you about the solution that we've been working on for running workshops when there is limited or no internet access. But mostly we want you folks to do the talking today to tell us how we can develop uh, this project into something that will help you best. Uh, some of you might already know what Carpentries Offline is. Some of you might have attended or plan to attend the lightning presentation. And some of you might not know what the project is all about. So I um, just want to start sharing my screen here. Uh, no, I just need to share the right screen. Where is it? Yeah. And there we go. Can you all see my screen there? 
Yes. Thank you. Um, and I should have I had that up there when I started talking. But anyway, you know now who we are. So uh, what I thought I'll do is I'll just start with a, a recap of uh, what uh, I did for the lightning talk. Um, if you still plan on going to the lightning talk, you'll see this again. <laughs> um, um, so just so that anybody who's here who does not quite know what it's all about will give them some background. So in 2021, I attended a collaborations workshop, uh, which is an annual event organized by the Sotheby Sustainability Institute here in, this, in the UK. And during this uh, workshop, uh, we explore some problems and some solutions uh, to, to some of the problems. And so this is how Carpentries Offline got started. Um, the problem we faced was how to run Carpentries workshops in areas where there is limited or no internet access. And so next I will tell you about the plan that we came up with. And by the way, we won the Hack Day first prize uh, at the uh, collaborations workshop. And a few months later, I was awarded an SSI fellowship to develop the project further. So I'm going to start with a bit of a background. Um, the Raspberry Pi is a credit card sized computer and not something you eat. Um, and they were originally developed for educational purposes. But uh, don't let the size fool you because they are actually quite powerful. So from the third model, they have onboard Wi-Fi. They have an Ethernet uh, network port. There are four USB ports an HDMI, HDMI display, um, and uh, they actually can take two monitors, this, la this latest model, and they can have up to eight gigabytes of RAM. And they sell for between 35 to $75. Now you don't have to use a Raspberry Pi, you could in actual fact use any available computer, but we are focusing on the Pi because they allow us to package everything that you will need to run a workshop on less than a 16 gigabyte micro SD card. And that's the little SD card there. Uh, and all you as an instructor will need to do is to download a somewhat biggish file. It's about five gigs. Actually, it's less now that's, that Colin has packaged it uh, nicely for us. Uh, you have to download that from the internet and write it onto the SD card using this uh, program that you see a screenshot of. Then you just put the SD card into the Pi and you can now stick it in your pocket and you are ready to go to go and run your, your workshop. And if you want, you can, because you buy that bare board, but if you want, you can actually um, buy or print a nice case for yourself. And um, so, the way this whole thing works is usually our setup will look something like this, where our learners, uh, which who are the laptops here on the right hand side, connect to the internet um, to an access point. Uh, for example, you might know EduRoam. If you EduRoam, if you've traveled to different universities, then you connect to the university uh, network using EduRoam, and um, that connects you to the local area network of the university. The, and, and then the access point uh, connects to the internet on the other side. And um, on the internet, of course, is the Carpentries. Uh, so there's a server that serves the Carpentries web pages. And on there, there are also and, uh, are links to things like GitHub that serves, uh, that serves our lesson material. Now, if that LAN, that WAN, sorry, this is a, the internet side of things, it's called the WAN, the wide area network. If that connection breaks for any reason, then you are cut off from the internet. Uh, you could potentially use your phone data, but that could be quite expensive. So what we do now is to replace this access point with a Raspberry Pi. And on the Raspberry Pi, on the SD card of the Raspberry Pi, there's a website with all the learning materials and downloads that you will require to run a workshop. Your learners will connect to the Raspberry Pi, um, which they will see on their list of access points 
as Carpentries Offline. So once you are connected, you can then navigate using your browser to the Carpentries Offline homepage, where there are links to all the software and learning materials. Now, if you are interested in the project, either to use it or to help develop it, please get in touch with us. We have monthly meetings, uh, a Slack channel, and a Git repository with all the scripts required to create the SD card image. Uh, we also have a website that needs some work. And by the way, that is a, a hint for our designers out there to come and help us out. I'm also working on an instructor's onboarding lesson, which will be available in the incubator to help instructors get familiar with the Carpentries offline technology and how to use it during a workshop. And now it's pretty much over to you guys. I have two questions on the screen there. Um, and you are welcome to either <clears throat> give us some thoughts in the etherpad or it would be nice if we can just discuss things here. What are the problems that you are running into? And um, what are some of the things that you might want solutions for? Um, here in the UK, of course, we've got relatively good internet access. And I can only imagine what most of you are struggling with. I do not have first-hand experience from that. And that's what I hope. Uh, to learn from you today. What kind of problems do you have or foresee in running workshops with regards to internet access? And how can we develop this project to, to help you out? So um, between myself and Abhishek and Colin, we hope to be able to answer your questions. Are there any comments so far that anybody would like to? I'll switch the. Oh, uh, you have the questions there. There's, do you have any experiences you can share where you have had to deliver a workshop, but internet access or the lack thereof made things difficult? Or what are the circumstances under which you must deliver workshops where carpentries offline might be useful? I should probably copy that into the etherpad because I'm going to take this offline now and then we can look at one another uh, stop share there we go i see kim's just made a comment about um load shedding power failures in south africa yes that is the, the one i'm most aware of <laughs> because i speak to uh family and friends and colleagues in south africa quite a bit and i always it's about like talk it's about the equivalent of talking about the weather here in the UK. Uh, <laughs> there's always things going on with load shedding. So we know the power goes off. And um, and then, of course, there's the lack of internet, or you have interruptions. Um, so if we could run this, say, in a university, in, even if the internet goes off, you don't re have to rely on it. Uh, usually they at least have backup generators uh, to keep the power on. Um, yes, and as Abhishek mentioned, the uh, pies can conveniently run from a power bank as well. I actually bought a, where is it? I showed it to someone yesterday. Uh, I bought quite a beefy one and I've had the pie run on it for a whole day. And now I can't find it. It's uh, anchor. Uh, power bank, and uh, uh, I've had a pie run of it all day, so it should be able to last a workshop. So, actually, a question for yourself and Kim relating to that: the pie might run all day off a battery, but the sort of laptop that the average person coming to one of these workshops in South Africa would have, how likely is the battery to, on that to last the length of the workshop? Yes, so I have several laptops here with me and they last anything from zero to uh, quite a few hours. <laughs> so that depends on how new your battery is uh, and probably also the specs of the laptop because if it's um, a beefy laptop, then it might use the power much quicker. Um, 
actually I could find a, a, a briefly Dell laptop and that runs battery lasts very long but of course as the batteries get older they run out much quicker uh, Renato yes please you have a question yeah I was just wondering if anyone ever explored using the Raspberry Pis not just as the server component but also as a teaching computer uh, meaning that the students would actually get uh, a modified version of a Raspberry Pi that comes with a screen, and therefore this power issue could potentially be addressed that way. Yes, so I've given that quite a lot of thought, and that was in, in the beginning, that was my intention to go down that way to have a whole bunch of Raspberry Pis that could be taken along with little power banks. The only problem is if you take a Raspberry Pi and you and you try to buy a screen for it, you'll find that that monitor is almost more expensive than a laptop. Um, and um, since most people have laptops, I thought for starters, let's not focus on that, but it is something I would really like to do. Um, but yeah, like I said, I found that the, um, the, 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 the monitors that are available there and portable are really expensive. Um, to the extent that I'd rather buy a laptop uh, than one of those monitors. Uh, the Crow Pi, I'm not uh, aware of that one. So if you guys know of ones that are significantly cheaper, it might be great. Oh, I'll have a look at that. How much do they go for? Yeah, they tend to be on the order of like an, two to three hundred dollars. Uh, usually these things, the uh, Crow Pi or Aspad. Um, you know, the screen and everything uh, obviously adds up. Yeah, I mean, um, I've got a, this is a touch screen. It's just a seven inch and these things cost about 70 pounds. So it's more than the smallest Raspberry Pi. Um, but I, I guess you could get cheaper ones. Like I said, this one is touch screen. So it is uh, probably more expensive just because of that. Um, but ideally, if we can come up with a solution, uh, I know there's stuff like one laptop per child and those things are supposed to be like a hundred dollars. The, yes, uh, I was uh, going to mention that. Thank you, Colin. Um, we're also looking at, uh, at running Jupyter Hub, uh, which gives you Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, or Jupyter Lab, and uh, I actually use that in my workshops to make sure everybody uses the same platform. But that, if you use that, uh, it means that Pi you can use a fairly low uh, spec Pi because all they need to do is to connect to um, this Pi server that um, uh, serves Jupyter. Um, hub and that will give you the shell, bash shell. So I mostly do uh, software carpentries, but I think this will be also fine for um, for data and library carpentries, depending on what you, which of the, the workshops you run and the requirements they have. Uh, but yeah, I can do Python, uh, the shell and Git with that. Uh, yeah. Senator Toby has uh, a raised hand. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, please, Toby. Um. Um, I have a lower tech, not solution exactly, but something that might help. Um, I, I guess we talk about um, pair programming as a um, like activity that can be helpful in workshops in general. Um, and certainly I've seen circumstances where it's been really helpful. And, and I guess in a workshop where we had power, but could lose power at any time, I would plan to take the approach that when the power goes out, I'd ask the learners to pair up so that they were only using half the laptops in the room. And then if the power outage lasted long enough that those laptops started to 
die, which I guess could happen within minutes or it could happen within hours, um, then there's another, they could switch, switch to using the other person in the pair's laptop at least. It, it, it probably doesn't solve the problem, but it at least buys you a bit more time, I think. And pair programming anyway can be a very kind of effective um, uh, activity to help people learn uh, from each other. And I guess combining that with the Jupyter Hub approach would help as well, because if I understand how Jupyter Hub works correctly, when the when laptop A ran out of power and they switched to laptop B, they could log back into the Jupyter Hub with the same account that they were logged into on laptop A, and they could pick up where they left off effectively without having to um, get everything set up and, and catch back up again to where they were. Yes, yes, that, that's uh, that's absolutely true. Um, cause I guess I've been using that for our in-person and Zoom workshops, and that works really well. Um, I um, I was going to say something else. Yes, so it's a good idea. I think it's a, a really good idea to um, do pair programming. For various reasons, like you said, uh, it saves on one laptop uh, uh, that you can switch to later on. But I also agree that it's actually really nice to work in pairs on stuff. And I mean, I've seen in workshops where people are really um, engaged, they often end up working together anyway. So, or uh, so, yeah. It that is a, it's quite a good option. Um, I'm just looking at um, some of the messages here in yes yeah, so uh tell me your comment about uh um the data the genomic data carpentries um it might or it might not be again um depending on the number of files you can get your hands on you could probably um set up something because the uh, the requirements for um for the workshop is is not that high i mean it's not like you're going to do something with a whole genome or with massive uh, rna seq files or something like that um what uh, so i think you could potentially if you use the eight gig highs um i haven't tried it though but i wanted to but something if i remember right the the data cop the genomics one i would say the thing that uses the most power would be bwa mem for um align for alignment uh, i don't know you can correct me here if you think and i think that will run on an eight gig computer um but i'll try it and <laughs> maybe blog about it <laughs> and see how feasible or not that is um let me go to the next comment. Latin. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, Kim is mentioning here that lack of internet and lack of power are two separate issues, not necessarily both at the same time. Um, um, but uh, yeah, I think we've we've kind of discussed both. They could be independent. They could happen independently of one another, and how we would. Uh, in the beginning, I have to say, I was looking at no power, no internet, but uh, because there are kind of different issues and uh, uh, to address, I thought, let's start with a no internet, uh, but there's no reason why this project can't develop into addressing the other issues as well. Uh, I would I would really be for it, and uh, I think it's uh, it would be really interesting. I uh, went to a conference here in Newcastle a, a few weeks ago, or a couple of months ago maybe, and there was a lad that uh, had, he used, I, I don't know what the hardware was that he used, but they had solar panels uh, that charged the battery, and all of that they had a little box with a projector and the idea was that that projector had all the learning materials so this was aimed more i think at school age children but i mean you can use it for anything 
I tried to get a hold of him, but he wasn't answering or responding to any of the emails or phone because I was hoping to be able to tap into their resources and things that they've already done. But that was he was going exactly along the lines of what I was thinking. Um, I would just like to get away from using um, what's it lead acid batteries, um, and there are alternatives now that are much more. Um, environmentally friendly i think uh, but i think that's still one of the big biggest things with batteries if you're going to go and charge big batteries they are of course very easy to find i think in most parts of the world but um uh, yeah we still have the environmental consideration there but it is a feasible solution to do that kind of thing uh, and i hope i can later start looking at that too uh, yes, uh, Albert uh, says if SSH access is enough for a course, it can be used instead of Jupyter Hub. That is very true. The um, the problem, however, is not so much um, Bash or Git. Uh, what is more of an issue is Python, because the moment you start doing the Python lesson, you probably want a graphic user interface. And uh, that's why where the web solution is good if you uh, if you don't want to slow your local machine down. Uh, because I think a Pi, if we just look at the Pi, that will um, uh, th that should handle all of the software anyway, uh, especially the later ones. And in have you tried uh, <coughs> X session forwarding on that? I mean, I know it's old technology, but it can work for graphical editors. Say again? Uh, uh, X wait. session forwarding. X you, session for? Forwarding. <laughs> yeah, it, it means you... Uh, oh, forwarding, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, Yes, um, no, I haven't looked at that, but yeah, I remember, um, yeah, so that you used like an X terminal, like there used mm -hmm. to be Hummingbird and those things that you could, um, you actually run the uh, GUI remotely. Yes, I haven't I used that did. technology in years, but uh, maybe it, it can still work. We did talk about um, having a screen share option so that if you don't have a projector, that the learners could watch what's on the um, instructor's screen and maybe using something like VNC for that. And there's quite a few web wrappers for that these days, but we haven't got anywhere in really investigating that. So if anyone has any good ideas about how we can do screen share, but yes, we could also do a remote X login or X login through VNC to a web page where you VNC don't see an X, maybe, X server. This may be better. Um, but yeah, one of the things I'd always worry about is that you won't have power to run the projector if the power goes out, or you won't have a projector at all. And so having some way of everyone being able to see the instructor's screen is also quite important. Yeah, I'm um, actually looking, I'm just trying to find this, you get these tiny little projectors, which is what I think this lad that I was talking about. That... Uh, the small projectors that run on batteries, right? Uh... Uh, well, this one runs off USB. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, you can run it yeah, off a power so bank. Yeah. It, I'm sure it will run probably even longer than the, well, oh, maybe as long as the Pi, because, yeah, light shoes did use a lot of power. Um, so you could use something like this. This one was very expensive. I bought it quite a few years ago. I don't know if the prices have come down. Uh, and it's actually dingy. This box makes it look big, but it's. Um, where is it? There we go. That's that's the projector. And um, yeah, it runs off a USB cable with, um, I guess this is to get draw power from two, two USB ports. But I guess if you have a beefy power supply like the one I bought, then uh, that should suffice. Um, yeah, so again, I think with these things, it's just um, 
We also don't want to make the whole project too expensive. So if we can find cost-effective ways of, of uh, making this kind of technology available, then of course, because it's small, it's easy to carry with you and uh, get somewhere where you're going. Um, and I think that, that might be nice for any instructor because you're going to go somewhere and not necessarily know what you have on the other side in terms of screens and uh, monitors and things like that. Um, yeah, I also, yeah, uh, Renata, I've been taking note of your comments here on the pro pie. I'm going to uh, only last about three hours. So, yeah, I think it depends on the battery that they've put in, in it. And, um, but if it is a Pi under the hood, like I said, um, I've managed to, okay, so the, the, the power supply I'm talking about was about a hundred pounds. So that's quite expensive, but um, you could, if we look at the alternatives to that, it should be possible. And uh, that is something that we haven't looked at yet, but definitely any um, ideas that we can take into consideration. I'm also just reading uh, and Yeah, so Renato is also asking slight technical question on GitHub carpentry addresses automatically resolved to the carpentry's offline server. So what happens, uh, Renato, is that the Pi comes online and the access point is carpentry's offline. So you connect to that. And then you use the carpentry's offline.org domain, or that's what we use at the moment. We're, we're using the carpentry's offline domain. And when you go to the home page, then uh, on there you also have a link to Git. So we're not using Git um, GitHub because, of course, we won't have access to it. And Git is a, a very lightweight uh, sort of equivalent of GitHub. Um, what we are looking into, but we haven't had an answer yet, is uh, being able to use a subdomain of Carpentries. So, uh, so since people are using carpentries.org, they probably know that, using a subdomain on that, but we haven't uh, been able to clarify that yet. So for the moment, we've got, we just use carpentriesoffline.org, and um, yes, that result, or that's supposed to resolve them. Um, Colin is saying here, lead acid batteries are very recyclable, but they weigh a lot and uh, don't provide as much power as lithium batteries of the same weight. That's true. Yeah, so um, they probably will last longer, but they also weigh significantly more. So I'm trying to think now. Um, a colleague of mine on one of the previous projects, she, it was a, an energy project and she didn't like lead acid batteries and i'm i thought it was because they're not recyclable so i'm wondering why she didn't no lead them. is easy to recycle but yeah so i the other yeah. problem with lead acid is you can't discharge them fully so you actually can't discharge them below about half to a third of their rate of capacity whereas lithium batteries you can discharge almost to nothing yeah um yes uh abhishek here mentions the what did you call them the other day colin the, um, lithium ion phosphate lithium ion phosphate uh yes those are the latest ones and uh anchor now has a battery pack available and power and solar panels and that was the one i was really interested in uh, and I would have tried to buy one to take to South Africa with me, but I couldn't get KLM to respond to my questions about putting that on the plane. Because according to what I've read, these lithium ion phosphate batteries are not uh, flammable. So they, they don't have the pro problem of the normal lithium ion ones that just explode. Um, so theoretically, they should be allowed on planes, but I don't think 
anybody at security is going to know anything about that to allow them through. Um, so um, I think they will probably in future be a good option. Um, Uh, Renata, you're mentioning uh, Colin's question about the screen sharing. And um, that is what Jupyter Hub does. I don't know, do you know Jupyter Hub? Yeah. So um, I don't know if um, what you mentioned here, that's not one that I'm meant, I know. Well, it's not screen sharing. Oh, I see. You're talking about sharing the instructor screen. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is something we can look at. And you know, Colin, this makes me think, um, and Abhishek, we haven't really thought of also what might be worth including in the instructor's onboarding is how to switch between these screens or how to arrange your screen to have suggestions like that on our website so that people have an idea. Uh, because I think, especially on Zoom, you find sometimes people don't know how to get from one screen to the other. I mean, it's a simple, probably for us as old tab, but uh, not everybody is can comfortably do that. Uh, and I think if users were fine. Oh, what do you think about the WebRTC? Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Colin. Just think about WebRTC solutions is there is Jitsi, which is an open source um, video conferencing yeah. solution, but it's quite heavyweight from what I saw that maybe not. Yeah, I checked check right. Jitbit and it seems it's not, uh, you have to pay to have it self-hosted and it's a significant amount, which well, we, we can explore only if there is no other solution. Uh, like like just having a project on the screen, <laughs> which is probably the most simplest method. There has to be open source. Solution. Yeah, yeah, this one is not. Uh, I'm assuming it runs on something like Jitsi based technology, assuming it's called Jitsit. I don't know if, if, if it derives its name from that. But, uh, but yeah, Jitsi can also be a pain to set up, right? And it's not just the uh, uh, computational load. Um, I think a VNC server uh, makes sense because um, I think that would be lightweight and we are all, it's, it's a trusted network, so you know, there's, there's no notion of you know, people snooping in. Here. So. Guacamole. I don't know about that one. Yeah, I, I've seen guacamole. I think that could work. Okay. Oh. Yeah, so these are quite interesting ones. Um, I'm just wondering are they going to, do they save the chat? Uh, if, yes, it says the... recording on. I presume that means the chat messages yeah. get recorded. Oh yes, they do. So we should be able to, it depends on whether they set it to be. Uh, um, I think we've got the etherpad mirroring pretty much everything that's been said in chat as well. Oh, good. Um, yeah, as you know, my note taking abilities are pretty bad. But so thank you to everyone who's been adding to the etherpad. Um, as co-host, I think you were able to save the chat as well, Janetta. So... Oh, all right. Actually, I think everybody can. You just need to remember to do it at the end of the call. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. I see. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, any other questions? Any other suggestions? This has been great so far. Um, yes, Toby. I'm going to change the subject to lesson content, I suppose. Yeah. And I think that having Git T uh solves a big part of the of the problem in terms of like parts of our lessons that need an internet connection um but i wonder if you've thought at all about what advice to give people about how to get help and how to debug when they run into trouble if they don't have an internet connection um a lot of carpentry lessons include a section or multiple kind of parts where they talk about troubleshooting strategies and where to go to get help and 
I would guess that in a carpentry's offline workshop, you would probably want to give slightly different advice or expanded advice in um, along these lines. Um, I'm thinking about, for example, if somebody wants to continue to learn to program in a place where they have very unreliable internet or they have to go somewhere, and especially if they have to like pay, I guess, to get internet access, then you want to give them some advice about how they can use that time most effectively. And my strategy for debugging being like immediately Google the error message and then try something else and Google that error message and so on is not necessarily the best approach to take in these circumstances. And instead I saw somebody writing about like a, um, what did they call it? A debugging diary approach, I think. Um, where they would try on their own to figure stuff out and they would write down all the things that they tried so that then if they needed to look stuff up online or whatever and they were trawling through github discussions and they see something that looks like it might be similar to what they'd seen if they've got these things copied and pasted somewhere then they can refer back to those notes in a way that I'm just not in the habit of doing. And I think, um, do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, I think so. Um, um, I was just thinking, and I think I have thought about this before. And I, one thing I would, uh, I thought was that what we can do is to keep, uh, to have sort of an FAQ section that, um, that we can build up or, you know, the typical types of searches that people do. And this goes on to the Pi server as part of, uh, so we almost build up our own little Google server there on the Pi. But this doesn't help the person, a student, when they go away, except that if we can make that available for download on a memory stick so that they can literally copy it from the, uh, before they leave the workshop, they can copy that onto a, um, so, so this knowledge base can be taken along uh, with them. Um, the other thing I was um, thinking about is I, uh, I have quite a large library of uh, PDF books um, that I, I often use. And of course, if um, now some of them are you are meant to pay for them. You're not supposed to share them, but a lot of them could also be free. Um, and if we build up a repository uh, of those that students can take along with them. So uh, what all I need is a memory stick and uh, you'll have a whole of HTML pages. Or they save it on their laptop. Yeah, 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 they save it on their laptop. Yeah, I'm just thinking of, if we can also find a way of making it searchable, then um, and then every time instructors get the latest version of the Raspberry Pi image that will come with it, so that might grow fairly big, though, um, which might affect the, the image, but it could also be provided as a separate download. I just remember growing up in the early internet era of dial-up, where I would often have you know an hour or two online a week. And one thing I did while learning to program is I downloaded quite a lot of offline reference guides that yes. I would then constantly consult while I was programming. And then often would realize there were pointers in these as, oh, you can go and download this other reference guide the next weekend when I have my two hours that I was allowed online, go and download those and then spend the next week reading over them. And maybe that yeah. kind of model is more what we need to encourage. And we need to, yes, just give as many offline resources as possible. I think, I think that's exactly what you ought to be aiming to do and I, but i think that then the time spent talking about um help search strategies i suppose needs to be used slightly differently like there's not much in the in the lessons themselves about how to read a help page like a man page for example but i think that this is really actually essential um, as a skill full stop but I think especially in this in in this kind of setting because 
it can be as as simple as being able to like parse what is meant by the usage statement but like we it's one of these expert awareness gap things i think but we very seldom actually stop and talk about what does the square what are the square brackets mean in a usage mm -hmm. statement what does the dot 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 mean what and and so on right and, and talking about how best to search through docs to find the specific thing that you that you're looking for um the structure of a documentation page and that kind of thing i think um it feels to me like in this kind of workshop more time invested on that stuff would really pay off for the learners afterwards yeah it sounds like we could have a whole separate branch of this project just looking at making offline documentation available in and instruction on how to use it and that would be extremely applicable to the in-person online workshops too. Um, I think it sounds like a lot of the problems we experience here might actually address problems that we have in uh, the, the normal workshops too. Um, and just don't think about because of this expert awareness gap that you mentioned though. Because now as you were talking, I realized, yeah, people don't know what square brackets and angle and those brackets and things mean. And I, I mean, sometimes those man pages are bad anyway. <laughs> they, they can be really difficult to understand, even if, if you use them almost every day. <laughs> um, yeah, Kim, Kim says there no TikTok, no troll infested social media. <laughs> What's not to like? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm also, I'm also, I have to say, it would be really nice to have a, um, a decent knowledge base that is the way you don't, you know, a stack, uh, what's it, stack, what's it called? Overflow. Stack Overflow, thanks. Uh, stack Overflow, where you search something and the, the answer is 15 years old, and you only realize that after 15 minutes of struggling to figure out what they're saying. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, like I said, I think we might find that if we start with addressing those problems, that it will be usable way beyond just carpentry sort of lines. That might be a very good resource to start working on. I guess we should distribute things like, you know, the official Python documentation for the APIs, because I think we referenced that in the, the Python lesson, but we tell people just go to the, the Python website and it's there for you. Well, obviously you haven't got pretty good internet, you can't do that. Yeah. And also the lessons material themselves, we always tell learners, oh, the, the lesson material will always be available on the Carpentry's website. Well, that may not work in this situation. So they need to take a copy of the lesson material itself as well. Yeah. So. Uh... That's something that we'll have to think of. How can we make these things available to, to students? I think the easiest would be to have them, okay, so to have them either take a memory stick with it, to maybe make memory sticks available, or to have them copy it onto their laptops, whichever will be most suitable. And I think um, maybe one zip file that has all the resources in one file they can download easily. Yeah. I just found that downloading from the Pi, especially if you have the normal Pi uh, network card, didn't work well. So um, I bought a USB uh, network uh, Wi-Fi dongle to see if, if that will improve it, but I haven't played around with that. Well, I did once and it was significantly better, but uh, I haven't gone beyond that once. <laughs> so that will also take some... But um, the one thing I wanted to do, which could be probably be used in more ways, is for when we do the carpent the commentaries offline onboarding, uh, instructor onboarding workshop, because of the problems of downloading the image, uh, I was thinking of getting memory sticks that we could give to um, to the instructors. But of course, we will need to get some sponsorship for that. And then uh, you could have something similar that you have for students that they can take away. So they basically take away with them all the materials they have. They, they'll pretty much need to work independently.
Uh, what Toby said also hits on another issue is that we might need to slightly rewrite quite a few of the lessons. Like the, the Git lesson in particular obviously needs to be rewritten to use um, Gitia. Um, but some of the other lessons might need some subtle rewriting as well to work around this. So there might be some effort needs to go into building lesson content for offline use. Yeah, so I'm just thinking to get more people on board for, for the project, we could probably uh ask uh for people who are interested in doing that because they don't need to know about the technical side of it all they they'll just be interested in developing lessons like we have people interested in developing lessons for the normal stuff yes toby i think um i think at least for lessons that are using the workbench um infrastructure I, I might prefer to see instructor notes put into the, um, okay. what's the word, like canonical version of the lesson. Um, cause, cause with the workbench, we can put instructor notes next to the part of the lesson that they're most relevant to rather than having them kind of abstracted away. Right. That would definitely be to maintain that being a separate lesson um, that we constantly have to keep in sync. Well, so, so and then I think that the, you wouldn't put, for example, with the Git T thing, you wouldn't put the entire content for teaching with that in an instructor note in the in the Git lesson itself. But in the instructor note, you could say, you know, um, for a offline workshop, um, you would want to instead of this section, you want to follow this other page, and then a link to that, I guess, and then what you folks would need to maintain is a much smaller set of lesson material that is just the like replacement parts that you would um, splice in for your workshop setting and then go back to the to the normal lesson content and then yeah I think it still solves your like maintainability issue of having to keep the lessons um, in sync with the changes in in the in the kind of data carpentry version or whatever um but gives you kind of um yeah gives you still the kind of control and the ownership of the of the stuff that's relevant to your project yes yeah, so would you say that um that then becomes part of the lesson the normal lesson um that it has in other words uh, where the lesson is are hosted online there will be links to say that if you're running offline go here so that when we copy that into our image uh it automatically comes into that into on yeah the and then when you follow the link offline hopefully it would you'd find some clever way for it to, to not try to access the internet to go to that page but instead go to your um locally hosted one i don't know I don't, honestly, I have no idea how all of this stuff works, so that's up to you. I'm just trying to um, figure out what the the best, I guess, balance is in terms of like um, not bloating the um, the official lessons with a lot of extra stuff that most of the time people aren't gonna want, and and giving you the um, kind of the, the ownership as well of, of what's what's relevant to the project i had but i also think that if you write an episode that's about how to read documentation pages for example um, or like strategies for searching and, and and reading and finding what you need to know from documentation pages i think that'll end up being useful in basically every workshop and not only in an offline setting yeah yeah definitely so that will be a contribution to the normal main lesson yeah it is just uh, like you said, if the GitLab, the GitHub needs to now point to um, Git T. But wasn't there talk also? What what about if people we we sort of by default use GitHub, but what if people want to use GitLab? Is there a at the moment there isn't an alternative lesson for that? Is there for episode for GitLab? The differences are quite minor. I've taught the lesson with GitLab, and it's not much that you have to change. 
Yeah. I think yeah. there is a lesson out there. I don't, I don't know how up to date it is with the with the current version of the of the software carpentry Git lesson, but I think there is a a lesson out there that teaches with GitLab instead. And um, I mean, Colin's right. That's what we used to teach at uh, Emble as well, Renato and I. Um, and the you know, it's it's slight terminology differences and differences in where to find things in the interface, but otherwise it's it's pretty much one to one um, in terms of what you're what you're showing and in what order. Okay. And you see there's some talk in the chat about network speeds and bandwidth. So before jumping off the topic again, are there any more comments on the on the lesson content and how we can cope with differences in that? And what we need to cope with. Mm -hmm. uh, so the comments in in the chat was going towards network speeds. Albert was saying network speed on the fly is limited because it goes through the same chip as the USB connections and has to share bandwidth. Um, the External adapter that I tried did make a difference, I think. Uh, unfortunately, I I just tried it here at home and had and went to a different machine and downloaded, and it took minutes. Whereas when I did it uh, with my colleagues at the university, uh, the same download was going to take hours. So I think the external USB dongle did make a difference. I don't know if that, um, but like I said, yeah, um, and Colin mentioned that we still need to test that in more detail because what happened was I also went and bought another um, dongle and then it used different drivers, so I couldn't get that going on the fly yet. Um, it has a different chipset. Anything else? Any other topics that you'd like to discuss? If no one's got anything else, one other thing I'd like to throw out there is one thing we haven't replicated yet is the surveys. And if anyone had any good solutions for how we could run the um, pre and post workshop surveys, presumably it would have to be done at the start and end of the workshop, um, unless they're on paper. But maybe if anyone knows of a nice platform that would be runnable on a Raspberry Pi that could have a a simple form and then show the instructor the results. Uh, bonus yeah. points if you can then make it synchronize those back to the carpentries when um, they are finished and when you get internet back. Uh, what is Lime Survey, uh, Kobe? How does that happen? It's uh, um, it's it's like a self-hosted survey platform i don't know if it's open source i think it might be though um it's really what it is not is lightweight at least in terms of like the user interface it, they have gone for a what do you call it a feature rich environment and so like you can do you can create a survey that does anything that you want it to do really like um it might not be able to make you breakfast but it could do everything up to that <laughs> point i think um but the problem with that is that the interface is therefore very busy and kind of overwhelming. And, and if all you want to do is create like a minute card survey with two questions in it, then it can be quite painful to go through the process of doing that compared to something like SurveyMonkey, if you're used to using that, which has its downsides, but the user the user experience at least is is pretty good i think and, and they've made it pretty easy to to do the i guess 95 percent of things that people usually want to do and at the, i guess at the cost of the kind of long tail of of things that only a few people want to do some of the time um lime survey makes it possible to do everything um but yeah it was self-hosted and you could export the um 
you could export the results of surveys in a bunch of different ways. And so I don't know how Typeform is, or how we're storing the results from the Typeform surveys in the carpentries. But if there's, you know, if there's something that Typeform can do to import results from a text file, then I'm sure we could find a way to, to make that work. Um, I, I shouldn't say things like I'm sure. I I think we would be able to find a way mm. to make that work. Is Typeform commercial or open source? Abhishek says Lime Survey is fast. Yeah. yeah. And Albert has a hand up. Yeah. Yeah, I sent a link uh, in the chat of a long list of software that can be self-hosted and it's all of it is uh, free software uh, oh. yeah it's too long to to use all of all of it but uh, you can look at the categories you need and check what uh, what will work for specific use case okay yeah so is this all kind of self-hosted software, not just surveys? Yes, it's all kinds. So we, you can check uh, VNC and so on. Um, yeah, OK, that's an interesting one. We can have a look in there. I mean, um, we could potentially, so all oh, right. I'm just thinking uh, what Colin said, uh, it would be ideal if we could upload the surveys to um, to the carpentries. So the the surveys, when we look at them, the results, Toby, are, is that still all in type form? That's not part of Amy, is it? Correct, it's in uh, type form, and then the link gets sent over to Amy once it's been generated. Uh, okay, so Amy just contains a link. So if we wanted to update, we'd have to update with uh, the Carpentries instance of type form. Yes. Right, <laughs> thanks, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, that would be interesting to see if. <laughs> if that is possible. Because um, um, actually, yeah, I, I mean, it, worst case scenario, we can just uh, create something that is specifically a, uh, that, that mimics the carpentry's uh, surveys um and then we can upload it to type form afterwards i think that's almost might be more difficult than getting the survey answers than most building a basic form isn't hard showing it in a nice graph to the instructor maybe a little bit harder and uploading it to the carpentries yeah it's probably the hardest bit yeah. but shouldn't be impossible So um, are any of you interested in coming to help us out with some of these problems? Uh, Toby. So when that really, it, <laughs> it, it meets the, the only question that I had left to ask, I suppose, which is like, in what ways are you looking for people to get involved at this stage because I think we've identified technical and relatively non-technical things that would need doing from here and it feels like for example getting some folks together to read through the existing software data and library carpentry lessons and identify things that rely on an internet connection um, would be a really helpful exercise and something that a lot of people in the community could get involved in. 
whereas some of the technical discussion is you know it's going to be a subset of the community to say the least who are going to be able to to get involved with with solving those problems um so what i mean there are people here and you did just ask if, if any of them would like to get involved and help but i wonder if there's do you have a timeline for what's going to happen next and when might be good opportunities to try to get the community more involved in some of these some of these tasks um, I I don't have at the moment, but I was just thinking it might be a good idea to to do that. Um, I probably ask for some advice and help on on setting that up um, because as we were talking now, and that's why I ended up asking the question: Who wants to come and help? Uh, that has been my concern all the time because uh, the team, as it is at the moment. We can't take on many of these tasks because it's it's just too much. So I need to, we need to be able to get people who are interested in taking that on, and uh, so that at least we, the people who are there now, can enable the rest of of them to 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 get going. Um, yeah, so I think I need to take some advice on how to get started on that. Because yeah, there are lots of things that can can be done. Um, we can have someone looking look into the surveys. We can have someone look into the lessons, um, and that could be several people because we, the lessons take a lot of time. We could even have one person per lesson, or several people per lesson, like you have an, in normal lesson development and maintenance. Yeah, yeah, Toby, please. All right. So, I, do you have an invite link for the Slack workspace? I guess that people need to follow to join that Slack because that, and it, if you open issues for the things that have been discussed today on whatever GitHub repo, it's appropriate to open those issues on um, and give people a way to join the Slack workspace. And then I think. Um, a good follow up from this session might be to write a blog post for the Carpentries blog, um, giving a lot of space to the how you can help and how, how to get involved part. Um, and then I suppose another way, and I really don't know whether this is practical, but another way that we might help you find people would be if issues on the Carpentries offline repositories became fair game for the GitHub contribution element of instructor training checkout. But, and, and I mean, repos that are in the incubator are already fair game. And so on the, um, the onboarding material, for example, you've already got that, that covered. But my guess is that you've got things that are not lessons and those things are not appropriate really for for the incubator so that's a conversation you'd have to raise with um someone that isn't me <laughs> i guess it's an instructor training question so um something to ask the trainer leadership i okay. guess um but I, I don't know i can i could imagine that that would be in a slow kind of drip fashion would be a way to, to get new contributors um, but the blog post and possibly like a themed community discussion which is of course what this kind of is but if we can really make a kind of devoted publicity push specifically around that blog post and, the, and a, a couple of themed community discussions that would happen shortly after the post was published, then I think you might find that there's more engagement. And especially if you can explain or describe in the blog post a little bit more what kinds of tasks there are and what kinds of skills you're looking for people to bring and what kinds of experience you're looking for people to bring, because I think it's a pretty broad range, right? There are people who could come who don't know anything about a Raspberry Pi or whatever, uh, who would still be able to, to help with, with with this based on what we've discussed today.
Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so blog post number one, number two. Um, shall I speak to uh, um, Karen Word Ward uh, about um, I would say put a bug in her ear um, only because the um, there's a team that's going to start talking about what checkout looks like. And so um, this would be a good time for uh, them to talk about that, um, what that could potentially look like if that's the right place for it. Okay. Um, so And then also, if we create maybe in our carpentries that all our carpentries offline repository organization, if we create a repository where uh, people can post issues with things they think need doing, uh, and others can look there to see what the tasks are that are required. That that is what you said, Toby, isn't it? I think having a single place that you can point people to that's got like what needs to be done um, would be would be helpful. And I, I mean, in particular, from this discussion, it sounds like you've got a few. I don't know. Maybe Colin's opened an issue about the surveys question before, for example. But um, but if no, there was yet. an issue around, if, if, but if there's an issue around that somewhere, then people who've got experience with Lime survey or other options could talk about it there. And it could be a way to potentially organize like a, a co-working session where people try to actually get something like that up and running, try to um, try to create a survey that's the equivalent to the Typeform pre and post workshop surveys. I did just quickly look and Typeform, by the way, doesn't have a way to import response data from other sources. So we would need to look at instead importing from both places and combining together in some other form, I suppose. But that's really that, that, that part of how it will work with the Carpentries uh, Typeform infrastructure is a conversation to have with the um, new director of technology when they joined, I think. Okay, um, so you also mentioned the community discussions. Um, so would it be possible to create a community discussion just around, um, suggest a community discussion just around um, Carpentries Offline? Okay, so I could do that, yeah. Colin and Abhishek, would you guys be up for that too? If we just yeah. have... Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like the co-working session, sort of a hackathon or sprint uh, for developing uh, some of these things. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm really reluctant to say that I want to be involved generally because I already don't have time to do all the things that I'm supposed to be doing, but... Um, if there were like a dedicated event, like a, a co-working session or a, uh, or whatever, with defined tasks that were to be completed, then I almost certainly would try to join that to kind of contribute in a really um, like a way that has boundaries, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah, yeah, sort of a focused session that uh, begins and ends at those times, and yeah. Um... Yeah, okay, that will be great. Um, so um, I have to, as a trainer also, of course, do some community discussions and that will be a good opportunity for me <laughs> to uh, kill two birds with one stone. That's terrible, I don't want to kill birds though. <laughs> um, yeah, this was quite this was quite helpful. Um, the only other thing that I I should just write it down here. I don't think our Slack um, invitation is open at the moment. I've been sending people, so I should just change Slack to allow 
people to join. I'll have to go figure out where to do that. Right, so we've got like seven minutes left. Is there anything else that you guys would like to say or contribute? One of the things I was going to say is that um, this doesn't just run on Raspberry Pis, and I do now have a very rough Docker file that should be able to deploy this on any computer that can run Docker, including a cloud server. And what I've actually done as a way of testing this code and also as a backup for myself is actually deploy this when I run a workshop. So I have a backup copy of my lesson notes, a backup Etherpad, a backup Git server, and I even experiment with the Jupyter server. Um, I did once have um, GitHub pages go down midway through a lesson I was teaching. And we couldn't access the next page of the course notes. So I've always been a bit um, sort of wary of that whenever I teach now and then make sure I have backup copies. So if anyone else would like to try that, maybe as part of a normal lesson, so you're not running a dedicated Carpentries offline lesson, then that would be a great way for us to help test stuff. Yeah, that's, I could do that. But, you know, see at our next... Um workshop which is in November because of all my other stuff in between um, yeah okay yeah, remind me Colin so when I, when I come back from South Africa to to that I wanted to do that <laughs> I'll make okay. a note when, yeah um, that would be great yes and so we, I I prefer that expert that idiom eat two dumb things with one spoon thank you I'll try and remember that one <laughs> Well, if there's nothing further, then um, I would really like to thank you all for coming along. This was a great session. I think we've um, covered quite a few things here, and um, I'm definitely going to uh, do what you suggested. You guys suggested here, so we uh, about um, getting some helpers and getting different uh, parts of the project going. That would be great. So, uh, and thank you, Abhishek and Colin, for um, for joining and helping out today. And I'd yeah. like to say that the um, recording is about to officially stop. <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs>